This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. On the phone with us right now is our very special guest of the podcast, Dan Miller. You know him as the Lions play-by-play voice on WJR. He's also the sports director, the head honcho over at Fox 2. And I know Dan is extremely busy, but he finds time to fit us into his schedule. You're just getting done doing an interview with Ashawn Robinson, and you're going to sit there and you're going to go and slum it up with us? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, we just got done shooting something for the TV side with Ashawn, and uh, it's just interesting to see, you know, that guy's got a pretty incredible body of work for somebody who's, I think, 21 years old. You know, all the big games that he's played in in his life, and that's one thing Terrell Austin also talked about today is how the situation never seems to get too big for him. The pedigree is certainly there, but um, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, what he's done, where he's going, and what he's ultimately going to be for, for this team. Talking about Ashawn Robinson, the future looks extremely bright for him. I know the other day I was having a conversation with a coworker of mine, and we were talking about him, and I personally, I feel like he's going to be that dominant run-stopping uh, interior lineman on that defense for years to come. Yeah, no, no, I, th- I think that's what you project him as, is, is being a run-stopper guy, run-stopping guy, and, you know, hopefully the word dominant becomes one that you associate with him. That remains to be seen, but um, I think that was kind of a given when he was drafted. The people thought he would be a very good run-stopper. I think the question was, could he be a pass rusher? And that's still got to prove itself out. But, you know, the way he plays with his head up and can be engaged with a blocker and disengage and make a play, um, he, he's got some very unique skills that I think are going to serve him well for a while and kind of be the next wave of of defensive tackles for for the Lions, and he's going to be a part of that. I think we've learned here how important it is to have as many of those guys as you possibly can. And, uh, you know, to be able to land a guy like him in the second round, we may look back on that as being a a very, very good day for the Lions. When you're talking about what Ashawn brings in and how we want to have guys like his caliber just basically across the board at every level on this team, do you think that's something that really separates the lines from teams like the Giants, the Cowboys, uh, the Atlanta Falcons? Is that what is kind of keeping them, maybe holding them back just a little bit? Well, I think you can say that it's uh, it's talent because there are certain things that the Lions don't do as well as some of those other teams. You know, the Giants' defense is, has taken such significant steps this year throughout the season and gotten so much better. Their secondary is really deep, and... You know, their pass rush has really come on, even without Jason Pierre-Paul the past couple of weeks. They've done a nice job of really getting the the different levels of their defense going. I think this year, the Lions at times have lacked a pass rush, and I think that's been a significant problem at times. I think that, you know, if you project it this week, it's going to be a huge key. Those guys have to play at a very high level, but I, I think you can take some of the teams that you talked about, and they're not universally the same, but some of them run the ball better than the Lions do. Some of them are more consistent on offense and, and making big plays than the Lions are. I think, you know, the Lions certainly need to continue to add talent to their roster, but I think they're in a good place to start. But as you mentioned, I think, you know, probably right now, they're still chasing some of those teams when it comes to talent. Doesn't mean you can't win a game on a Sunday or make the playoffs, as we're finding out quite possibly. But at the same time, this is, this is a work in progress. Let's, let's not forget, this team's a year removed from firing their general manager, rearranging their whole front office staff, and they didn't do that because they were happy with where they were. You know, the byproduct that you're seeing here is one year of Bob Quinn and some guys from the Mayhew era that have continued to develop. Now, Dan, following the tough loss to the Dallas Cowboys, we all know what's at stake this Sunday, Sunday night football, prime time the whole nation will be watching and being around the squad this week what is your vibe of the squad in your meetings with the players this week yeah no i think that you know when you left dallas at least the the, there was certainly i think a feeling of you know you let an opportunity slip away but i think in this league very quickly guys turn the page and it doesn't always happen and sometimes you know one game does beat you twice but i just think Jim Caldwell doesn't let that happen very often. I don't think they lost the Cowboy game because of the Giant game. They lost the Cowboy game because they made some mistakes and the Cowboys are too good to do that again. This head coach has a very unique ability to get a team's head in the right place. And I I think that he started doing that probably Sunday night right after the game. And it has continued this week. And, you know, I, I can tell you personally that, 
look, I, I've never made any bones about the fact that I'm invested. I care about this team. I want them to win. There's some Mondays where I've got in there to do my work with, with Coach Caldwell, as I have to do every Monday, and I feel like crap. You know, I'm pissed off they lost and, and down. You spend 10 minutes with him, you're not feeling that anymore because he's got a great attitude, and he understands that you have to put it behind you and make the next step. Now, he's not trying to do that to me. He doesn't have to get my head in the right place. It's only the players, but just he's got an infectious personality that I think a lot of people probably don't get to see very often, but he really is a master at putting things in the right light, and I think he's going to do that with his team. And I think whatever happens on Sunday night against Green Bay won't be because they were down or because they lost to Dallas or because they weren't ready. It's going to be the team that executes and plays well is going to win. There won't be a hangover when that game starts on Sunday night. A lot of people are also looking to the matchup between the quarterbacks, Matthew Stafford and Aaron Rodgers. Also, are there any other matchups that you're going to be keening in on for this game on Sunday? Well, it's got to be the secondary of the Lions for me. I mean, it's, it's that defense because I think, as I said earlier, take the, the, the back-end view, that secondary got torched by Dallas, and they looked significantly outmanned, and they were. I mean, this team did not bring Johnson Batamosi into play a ton of snaps, and, you know, certainly I don't think signed Asa Jackson with the thought that he was going to play a ton of snaps right now. But you were down Diggs, and you were down – um, Darius, and Dallas took advantage of that. They've got to play better. You know, hopefully Darius is going to be in there on Sunday. We'll see. Uh, they've got to play significantly better against Green Bay because you have even a better quarterback and a wide receiving court that's just as good. That said, I think it has to start up front. This has to be the dominant performance of the year from that front four, in my mind, for this team to win. I think they have to, to, to shut off the lanes for Rodgers. You can't let him run around back there. You can't let him sit around forever. However they have to do it, bring in an extra man, just using the front four, whatever it is, they have to make him miserable. They have to find some way to disrupt Aaron Rodgers. And they haven't been consistent doing that this year. It's been kind of a strange defense where you look at the numbers and they don't add up to the final score at the end because they don't give up many points. But I think it's got to be everything they've got in this game against that guy. I want to go back to Darius Slay a little bit. And we've seen the struggle that Batamosi's had in the secondary, and we've seen the struggle that generally just the secondary without Darius Slay playing has performed on the field. It's not been very good. What are the chances? What If you had to give it a percentage, what do you think that percentage is that Darius Slay suits up and plays and is effective on Sunday yeah. night? Guys, I, I don't know. We just don't get enough information to be able to give you something like that. I mean, it's, you know, fact is he's got the hamstring. He's now practiced for two days. It's going to come down to how that thing reacts. They, I'm sure they took a good look at it today coming off of practice yesterday. And same thing tomorrow coming off of practice today. And they'll, they'll have to see, you know, what kind of shape he's in. Is he full speed? Is he going to be at risk of hurting himself further? If there's any way he can get out there, I know he will. And it's huge for this team if he can. I mean, he, he is a top-notch quarterback in this league that they need against a top-notch quarterback in this league. And to help with guys like Nelson and assuming cop plays, whatever his status is, and Adams and Allison, just the, all the guys they can throw at you. And all the guys that become better just because of the quarterback. So I don't know if he'll play. I know he's trying. That's why he's out there practicing but it will ultimately come down to how that hamstring reacts. I want to switch gears on you just a little bit. I want to go to the offensive side of the ball. How imperative is it that Travis Swanson plays? And and can you kind of speak to what he brings to that offensive line? Because it looks a lot better when he's in there than when he's not. I I think last week uh, Matt Stafford got hit nine times against Dallas. And if you're a quarterback, that's, uh, that's getting your feathers ruffled just a little bit. Yeah, and more late than early. I thought early the offensive line played well and exerted their will and ran the football. Like, we really haven't seen them run the football at all this year. But, look, Swanson is a big part of what they do. And you get everybody back in their normal spot if he's able to play. So uh, I think it's a it's a big get for this team if he's able to get back out there and move Glasgow out the guard again and put every and regain your depth of guys coming off the bench when you need them. So, uh, you know, I think the, set, the fact that he's out there, he's obviously out of protocol, um, and as long as we don't see a setback this week, I anticipate he's going to play, and that's that's big for protection, big for the running game, 
big for everything that they want to do against the Green Bay defense that throughout the year, again, which is what you want to do, they've gotten better and they've got some guys that are, you know, obviously playing at a high level right now. They're doing a good job of spotting Matthews more often than they have in the past. And, you know, this is, this is a, a good defense that they're going to be going up against, whereas maybe you might not have said that about Green Bay a month and a half ago. All right, Dan, how much do you think good coaching plays a role in making what would be a bad team average or an average team good or a good team great in the NFL? I think it makes a huge difference. Absolutely makes a huge difference. And it's not just on game day. It's on development. It's in making your guys better. I mean, you can run a long list of Lions players that have improved significantly since 2014 when this coaching staff got here. And I think that's ultimately what's going to be the indicator of whether or not you're going to be successful in this league. You have to develop players. And for a long time, the Lions organization didn't do that. And, you know, you go back to the, the aughts, 2001 through 2008, you just didn't find guys sticking around here and getting better. So I, I think in that way, coaching makes a difference. I think on game day, it obviously makes a difference as well. I mean, pe- people, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that you thought the Lions were going to win four games this year and then not give the coaches any credit when they end up winning nine and maybe ten. I mean, this coaching staff has done a good job. They've maximized what people get out of this team and, and uh, what they've been able to get out of this team. I don't think they've left much out there. I think this team is ahead of schedule and where they anticipated being. I think that, you know, I, I give this coaching staff a lot of credit for having them in this game playing for a division title on the final Sunday of the regular season. So I think coaching is always a part of the equation. Now, expectations can change, and I know you said, I think most people going into the season, that we looked at the record and we looked at the way the team was constructed and we, we kind of put the record out there somewhere near 8-8, eight and eight, maybe 7-9. and nine. Let's say worst-case scenario, they lose to Green Bay, Washington wins. The Lions end up missing the playoffs after basically holding their destiny in their hands, holding a two-game lead in the inside track on the second seed in the NFC. Is that enough for Bob Quinn to go out and make that coaching change? And I know you just said, you know, Jim Caldwell does a great job in the room with these guys. It just sometimes seems like on a Sunday afternoon, the moment is maybe gets a little too big for him or it gets a little bit away from him. And there are just missteps or, or miscalculations on the field. I know with John leaving Matt Stafford out there and letting him take a couple hits late in the Cowboys game, that was a big issue. I know switching the game plan up and yeah. kind of going away from the run last week when it was extremely dominant in the first half. And I know that things change between the first half and the second half, but it just doesn't seem like Jim Caldwell does a good enough job making his own adjustments. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't want to get into a referendum on what Jim Caldwell is worth and whether or not he's good enough. I will say this. When you win, you know, eight games coming from behind in the fourth quarter, that tells me that you put your team in a position to win and you've done some pretty good coaching down the stretch. I don't think you get there by, by bumbling around and locking into it. This team has shown pretty good, cool under pressure, avoided some key mistakes that could have cost them those games. I think a lot of that is coaching. I think there will always be things that you could argue could have gone one way or the other. As for Quinn, um, look, there, there's one guy that knows the answer to that question, it's Bob Quinn. And I'm not going to get into trying to think of what he believes about Jim Caldwell. But the ultimate decision for Bob Quinn will be this. This might be his only chance as a general manager. You don't know. It is his job right now. And he's got to decide. He's had a year to figure it out. Is this the guy that I'm going to go forward with? And is this the guy that I'm comfortable with? And the answer very well might be yes. He may look at what this team has done and feel like they've maximized it and that he wants to go forward with Jim Caldwell as his head coach. But, you know, ultimately that's up to him. It's his organization on the football side to make that decision. And it's his job where ultimately that head coach is going to, in many ways, make or break the roster that he puts together. So it's going to be up to him. I have no idea what's in his head or how he feels about it, and that'll be something that we'll all see play out together. Dan Miller, sports director at Fox 2. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Miller Fox 2, and we'll get you out of here on this with the best-case scenario. Um, Lions win on Sunday. Washington loses. Let's say now the Lions are in the postseason. In your experience watching NFL football, watching playoff caliber NFL football, what will it take for the Lions to not only get into the postseason but have a successful run? 
stick to the game plan that has allowed them to get to nine and six. Look, they're not an overpowering team by any stretch. They, a lot of times, play just well enough to win. Their recipe for success has been don't turn the ball over and find a way to score enough to win. They're not an overpowering offensive team. They're not a great offensive team. But they've held up until last week eight straight opponents below 20. They've been in the top five or so among teams turning the ball over. They have been in the top five, top three most of the year in terms of turning the ball over. Obviously, they've turned it over more recently, which has hurt them. But their recipe is simple for success. Don't turn it over. Play it close to the best. Play good defense. Keep the score down. Find a way to win. That's what they've done to win nine games. They're not going to go out there and blow people away 42-7. to That's just not how they're built right now. What you've seen is what it takes and what you're going to get. You've seen how they win. That's the way it's going to, that, that they're ultimately going to have to do it. This week might be a little bit different because you're going up against a guy like Rodgers. You might have to score more than normal to win. You might have to get 27 to find a way to win this game. But I think ultimately their recipe for success is low scoring, low turnovers, don't make the big mistakes, find a way to win in the end. Part of the fun Adam and I have doing this podcast is talking football and talking with those in the know like yourself. Happy New Year, and it'll be a great New Year if you tune in to WJR Sunday night, 830, Lions, Green Bay. Dan Miller, thanks for your time. We look forward to further chats, hopefully in the postseason, maybe ahead of an NFC title game. Anytime, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. All right, boys. We'll see you.